imagine that you're a teacher in front of a huge lecture theater full of students, or, or worse, a presenter at a TED event. You're coming on to this red circle, and your heart is pounding. Your breath is really superficial, and you're really nervous, actually. Your hands are sweaty, and your mind is racing. Your heart is racing. And you wonder, do I have the subject knowledge to actually talk to these people? Am I an expert? Am I going to forget everything I've just been trained to, uh, to talk to you about? And then you suddenly remember you completed this uh, eight-week mindfulness foundation course, and a uh, yeah, mindfulness foundation course, and they told you there that in these kind of circumstances, stress, focus on, focus on the sensation of your feet on the floor. Focus on the sensation of your feet on the floor. And then tune in to the sensation of your breathing. And keep breathing. And then, okay, observe. Observe this anxiety, this, this stress. And, and actually allow, allow this to happen. Allow this cascade this waterfall of thought to stream through your mind and there's no need to attach to it. Let it just go and keep breathing. And then you're beginning to actually find yourself, your authentic self. And there comes a point when you can say, here I am now. Now, I am here. This is me. Actually, I am unique. And I am standing here in front of all these people who are completely unique. This is actually amazing. And I'm completely ready now to engage as me, with you, as you. And ready for the lesson to begin, or the presentation to begin. And I hope that in the next 80 minutes, I will share with you two further examples of meditation, but I will also talk a little bit about how to integrate um, contemplative practices into higher education, learning and teaching. So that was one example of maybe starting. Okay, so... We know from research that contemplative practices, which may include mindfulness meditation and other forms of meditation, that they have positive effects on the way we cope with stress and anxiety. There's research, very good, robust research, that shows that it has a positive effect on how we deal with um, mental health issues like depression. It also helps with chronic pain. But besides that, there is a general sense that it helps with um, psychological well-being, with human flourishing in a more broad sense, with authenticity, for example. And the question is, in higher education, we're dealing with learning and teaching all the time. How can we integrate these practices in learning and teaching to the benefit of our students, but as well as to the benefit of ourselves as teachers. And the profession of teaching is, of course, very highly driven. There's a lot of pressures on the teacher's time during the day. There's a lot of stress involved. And being able to bring mindfulness practices in our teaching and learning work can enhance our own sense of well-being and our own sense of flourishing. So, now imagine that you're a student. You're a student in a big lecture theater like this, and you've come to listen to a lecture. Now, you might be a traditional student, and it might be your first year away from home, or you might be a mature student, it doesn't really matter. You come in here, you might have rushed. Of course, you stay connected with your family and all your friends. In fact, you check your mobile phone about 150 times a day. 
just to make sure that you're not out of touch with your family and friends, that you are aware of the latest Twitter and, and, and Facebook updates, status, and so on. And, of course, that's very, very important. Now, you've come into this lecture theatre, you're very, very busy, but this particular lecture, she's a bit strange. What she does at the beginning of each lecture, she asks you to engage in a three-minute mindfulness meditation, just to settle you down. So why not join me in that, if you're comfortable? This is a secular form of meditation. So there's no religion involved, there's no spirituality explicitly involved. It's optional, so if you don't want to participate, then that's, of course, absolutely fine. So what we do is, we just become aware of our embodiment. Just feeling the body in the chair and the feet flat on the floor. And we allow the body to sit upright so that the spine is uncurled and the breath can come in and out by itself. And if you're comfortable, you can either rest your gaze in the middle distance or you can gently close your eyes. So tuning then the attention into that felt sense of the feet on the ground. And mindfulness practices are really about taking hold of the attention. And you'll find that the mind will wander to all kinds of other things, and that's absolutely fine. You just bring the mind gently back to the felt sensation of the feet on the floor. So we're not thinking about the feet. We're feeling them. What do you feel? Maybe warmth or coldness, pressure, tingling, maybe pain. Maybe you don't feel anything at all. That's fine. We don't judge, we just observe what is. The body is always in this moment. So tune into that sensation of the feet on the floor. And the sensation of the body on the chair, on the seat and the back. And then gently tune in to the breath. The breathing movement. The breathing in and breathing out. Just observing. No need to change anything. Just accepting how you find the breathing. Bringing the mind gently back to the felt sensation of the breathing in and out of the body. And staying wide awake. Mindfulness is really a practice of falling awake. Becoming fully aware. And then allowing your attention again to become aware of the sounds around you, and the room we're in and all the people around us. And then very gently coming fully back into the room with your awareness and opening your eyes. So just observing how you feel now compared to three minutes ago. Just a very simple exercise. Now that was an example of how we might introduce contemplative practices within a teaching situation. But of course, it's equally valid as a student, as a learner, to integrate this into your study. When you notice that your studying is becoming less effective, you're becoming distracted, you're becoming agitated. 
of course, it's also a very good idea to go for a run. It's absolutely terrific idea. And then come back refreshed. So it's a very simple way of re-energizing and regrouping the mind. Now, there is evidence, and it's emerging evidence, to suggest that when students regularly practice mindfulness meditation or similar forms of meditation, this improves their focus and concentration. And there's even now some evidence that it may enhance students' grades. But of course, there's a much larger potential benefit here, and that is, as a student, you're not just here to learn about your subject area. You're not just here to become an expert in your field, no. You're also here to grow as a human being, to really discover who you are. What is your relationship to yourself? What is your relationship to the world? And what is your relationship to your subject? How are you going to make that subject meaningful to you and the world? Or is it all just an intellectual exercise? So it's very important to, uh, to think about those questions when you're teaching as well as when you're a student. When we deliver our eight-week Mindfulness Foundation courses here at Queen Margaret University and evaluate them, we found that 95% of the people who participated in them felt that they had become much better at coping with stress. And over 80% of the participants said that they had become more effective in teaching and in learning. They'd become much more reflective. So those are very important gains. Of course, that's anecdotal. However, the research is absolutely amazing. And there's now actually a whole branch of science, which is called contemplative neuroscience. Contemplative neuroscience tries to put, give you pictures, tries to chart what happens in the body, in the nervous system, and in the brain when people meditate. And there's very robust evidence to suggest that when you meditate, particularly regular meditators, that the areas in the brain that get agitated or stressed in difficult situations don't get agitated or stressed in those situations in meditators. Now, that's all very well. That's all very, very nice to have that evidence. If, say, 60% of the research was to suggest that meditation is a good thing for you, would you then start to do it? The only way to find out whether or not to meditate is really to actually do it. So meditation is an experiential thing. Don't wait for the scientific data to show you that it actually works. So, I've given you an example of a meditation out of context, one meditation within a potential teaching and learning session. And now I want you to, to experience a brief one where we're actually going to work with a bit of text as if we're in a teaching and learning situation. So imagine you're in a, uh, a presentation, a TED talk. And this TED talk is about how to integrate contemplative practices in higher education. And the uh, presenter asks you to um, consider what the purposes of higher education actually are. So please, we're going to do it very briefly, ground yourself in your body, feeling your feet connecting with the physical sensation of the body, and the breath, and maybe bringing a sense of gratitude to the breath, because the breath sustains us. Now there's an idea from John Dewey, which is, that uh, education is preparation for life. Sorry, education is not preparation for life. It is life itself. So just repeat that to yourself a few times. Education is not preparation for life, but life itself. And then I'm going to say it a few times, and all I want you to do is let go of the meaning and just hear the sounds, hear the quality of the sounds, the rhythm, the volume, the pitch, and the texture of the word. Education is not preparation for life. It is life itself. 
Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. Education is not preparation for life. Education is life itself. And then, gently, come out of the meditation and open your eyes. And that's a very short example. This can normally be longer and then you have a bit of discussion and so on. I just want to briefly talk now about the qualities that we bring to the meditation and contrast them with what we bring to students in higher education and what we expect students to learn. So we expect students to become very critical, critical learners. And that's very important. But how can you do that if you also don't, if you don't learn how to do the opposite, which is to be non-judgmental? So in mindfulness, we ask you to come with an attitude of non-judging. We ask students to memorize things, ideas, concepts, and so on. In mindfulness, we ask you to let go and accept. Just let go. In universities, we train you, we train students to become experts in their subjects. We want people to become experts and show their expertise in problem-solving situations. In mindfulness and contemplative practices, every time we come to it, we come with an attitude of beginner mind. Every time again, it's as if it's the first time. No expectation. There is no outcome. There's no right way or wrong way of doing it. The only thing that matters is doing it. In fact, Woody Allen said, although not in, con in, uh, in relation to contemplation, but he did say 80% of success is turning up. And that really goes for meditation. So, clearly these practices can help individuals, can help us as individuals and collectively and globally to be sustainable and to flourish. And I will pose that when we integrate these practices into learning and teaching, we are really contributing to what's potentially going to be a global movement of people who are mindful, who can approach their work, their learning, and their teaching in a contemplative fashion. So try it, be open to it, develop your own practice, sustain it, share it, flourish, and let flourish. Just Imagine. Thank you.